and we're live. Welcome back to Prophecy 3 DNA, where we discover, decrypt, and demystify Bible prophecy and apply it. My name is Donnie Alvarenga, and this is my brother Don DeCuna, and we are honored to be facilitating this study of the Bible. Over the more recent weeks, we've been really diving into the book of Revelation, and what we discovered is that, well, we've talked about this at length, how the Bible is in a, uh, what's the what's the word again? When it's Chiasm. Uh, chiasm. It's in a chiasmic structure. And so it basically repeats the same thing over and over in a rhythmic pattern, if you will. And what we discovered is that in Revelation, it talks about, you know, um, seals and it talks about churches and it talks about angels, right? And so what we've discovered is that all of those kind of overlap talking about specific time periods and they're giving us a specific message. Well, this last cycle that we've been in, we've been talking about um, how the first way that the enemy tried to attack us was to try to wipe us out, right? To wipe out God's people. And when he noticed that that was just spreading it wild, like wildfire, he decided, well, if I can't kill them, let me join them. And so we've been exploring the different ways that he has been infiltrating, um, or as you say, Don, baptizing certain practices that are not biblical, really. And so today we're going to continue diving into that, correct? Yeah. So again, if I can't take them from without, I will take them from within. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So I, I think that was a, a great overview. So again, the first cycle we recovered, second cycle. This cycle is the Church of Pergamum, the third seal. And now we're talking about the third trumpet, right? And that was you know, really where we've been on this wormwood kick. Right. So what are some of these examples of wormwood or the deceptions that the devil brought into the church where we're baptizing these pagan things? Does that make sense? Not baptizing them in a repentance state, but baptizing them, meaning they don't change. <laughs> they remain pretty much as they were. We just call it Christian now. Does that make sense? We've ex we've accepted certain practices that were Correct. pagan as christian and Correct. We called it christian right so uh let's go ahead and pray to start us out so if you don't mind go ahead and pray yes our father in heaven thank you so much for um your wisdom and you know your grace in revealing all these th these things to us lord we pray that your holy spirit be with us now and that your spirit lead us to all truth in jesus name i pray amen amen okay so here again is our methodology and let's go back in so the last time we talked about some of the practices that the pagans had for hierarchies in a religious sense and how the Christian church adopted it. So, for example, one of those practices was a thing called um, the, uh, what was it, the, the Pontifex Maximus. Remember that? Mm -hmm. Okay, the, the great bridge builder, the supreme bridge, bridge builder. So basically the intercessor between the gods and the men. Okay, that title went from a pagan priesthood to a Christian priesthood. All right. We talked about the College of Pontiffs became the College of Cardinals. We talked about how the Vestal Virgins became nunnery practices. Okay. So some of these hierarchical classes that the church brought on or that, that the pagan uh, religions had became Christianized. All right. What we're going to do today is we're going to talk about some pagan holidays and observances that became Christian. And you'll notice here they're in little quotes. OK, <laughs> Christian holidays and observances. All right. So the, again, this is a deeper study. We're going to study historical pagan holiday and observances, some some pagan gods, and how they have extreme similarities to Christian holidays and observances. So here's the first one: Holy Week. Are you aware that in the pagan religions, in even in Roman times and Greco in in Hellenic times. There was something called a Holy Week. Did you know that? Uh -uh. Hmm. They had a Holy Week. So let's look at this. So right here, Holy Week. 
Let's read just the highlighted portions. The Principate brought the development of an extended festival or Holy Week for Cybele and Addis. Citizens and freedmen were allowed limited forms of partici partic participation and rights pertaining to Addis through their membership of two colleges, each dedicated to a specific task. The Canifores, reed bearers, and the Dendrophores, tree bearers. <clears throat> Canna intro, the reed enters. The reed was gathered and carried by the Canifores. Arbor intrat, or the tree enters, commemorating the death of Addis under a pine tree. The Dendrophores, tree bearers, cut down a tree, suspended it from an image of Addis. A three-day period of mourning followed. The tree was laid to rest at the temple of the Magna Mater. Mater. Sa sanguim or dies sanguinis day of blood a frenzy of mourning when the devotees whip themselves to sprinkle the altars and eff effigy of Addis with their own blood the sacred night followed with Addis placed in his ritual tomb vernal equinox on the roman calendar hilaria rejoicing when Addis was reborn some early christian sources associate this day with the resurrection of jesus okay so let's stop right there because there's, there's a lot of words being thrown out here there's this thing called a Holy Week that is dedicated specifically to the goddess either Cybele or Sibeli, depending who, who you want to talk to, they pronounce it differently, okay? And Addis. Now, Addis was her child and also her lover, okay? This is how the Greeks were. They were weird folk. The Romans adopted Cybele, therefore they adopted Addis. Okay, the Romans constantly did that. They would keep adopting everybody else's gods and their religions, right? So we can already see here that they talk about that some early Christian sources associate the death, burial, and resurrection of Addis with the day of the resurrection of Jesus, which is the vernal equinox, okay? Vernal equinox just means the spring equinox. You know what an equinox means? The time of the year when the sun and the moon are equal in the sense that the days are just as long as the nights. So, for example, there's equinoxes and solstices, all right? Christmas is an example of the winter solstice, which means that the days are shorter than the nights. Okay? The summer solstice means that the days are longer than the nights. But in the spring and the fall, you have equinoxes, so you can think of the word equals. Equinox. Okay? So that just means that there's a time where the, the earth and the distance to the sun will mean that the days and nights are pretty much equal. 12 hours a day, 12 hours a night. That makes sense? All right. So this was celebrated in the vernal equinox. What we're going to find out here later on is when the Easter ceremony is specifically aligned to. Okay? But again, we already see here that some Christian sources already have associated this specific day with the resurrection of Jesus. The day Attis was resurrected. Okay, let's keep reading. Um, Riqueto, day of rest, or lavatio, washing. There, are, there the stone and sacred iron implements were bathed in the Phrygian manner by a red-robed priest. Initium Kayani, sometimes interpreted as initiations into the mysteries of the Magna Mater, and Addis at the Guyanum near the Fir, Fir, Phrygianum Sanctuary at yeah. the Vatican Hill. Okay, so where in the ancient times, where was the ceremony done? The Vatican Hill. The Vatican Hill. The same Vatican Hill that today is where the Vatican stands, okay? Where a lot of red-robed priests hang out, okay? So this is the Holy Week of Sibeli and Attis. 
also known as Hilaria. That is the actual ceremony. Okay. And what you're saying is that this was this these were practices that were in place before we started celebrating. Well Easter. before we started celebrating our version of Holy Week. Now here are some similarities we're gonna find. At the beginning of the week, there is reed walkers, where people will walk around the city carrying reeds and waving them around. Okay. At the beginning of our Christian Holy Week, we have what's called Palm Sunday. Okay. Later on, we have points where there's called the Stations of the Cross. Have you ever heard this? Where people will take effigies of Jesus on the cross or they will just carry a cross around either Jerusalem or around where their towns or whatever. And there will be images of Christ suspended on trees. Okay. The, the reason I'm bringing this up is some people will say, see, the Jesus narrative is fake and Christianity as a whole just copied it from paganism. There are some people that will say that. What I would argue is that the devil has been a counterfeiter from the get-go. He's been throwing up smoke screens forever because he understands scripture way better than we do. He understood the prophecies way better than we do. Because guess what? There were prophecies that the Messiah would be pierced. There were there was prophecies that the Messiah would be hung on a tree. <laughs> Does that make sense? And so what does he do? He throws out all these random gods and he hopes one of them will stick. Does that make sense? And so as he's throwing out all these screens, also over three-day periods of mourning, okay? He hopes all the stuff will stick so that he can do as close to um, what he imagines the Messiah will do. Because again, he doesn't know the future exactly. And so he throws out as much similarity as he can, but enough that it is different from the true. So how do we know what is really true? We, we've, we've, we've talked about this before many times. We have to study the original to truly understand what is real. We, you don't study the counterfeit, you study the original. So you can spot the counterfeit. So now we can see a lot of counterfeit stuff here. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. So we're not going to go through fine tooth comb here because we really don't have time. We have a lot to cover. Okay, but I wanted to show here that even under the under pagan um, uh, a pagan worship system that was Greek and Roman, they had something like a literally called a Holy Week. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And there are very lots of similarities with the days of the Holy Week that is um, Christianity to use. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's go back here. All right. Let's look at the next thing here. So let's learn a little bit about Addis. So Addis was the consort of Sibeli. All right. His priests were eunuchs. His self-mutilation, death and resurrection represents the fruits of the earth with die in the winter only to rise again in the spring. And eventually Addis transformed himself into a pine tree. Okay, so that's the ultimate thing about Addis. We're not going to go too much into himself. He's just a very odd character. Okay, we're not going to study too much about him. But what I want us to understand here is one, there's this Holy Week. An interesting thing here is that Sibeli is known as the Magna Mater, which means the Great Mother. Okay, the Great Mother. Now let's look at Christian Holy Week. Let's read the highlighted. Holy Week, Latin, Hebdomada Sancta or Hebdomada Maior, Greater Week, 
ancient Greek, whatever those symbols are, um, is the most sacred week in the liturgical year in Christianity. Okay, so do you know what liturgical means? It's like ceremonial. Ritual or ceremonial. Okay, keep reading. Holy Week begins with the commemoration of Christ's triumphal entry into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, marks the betrayal of Jesus on Spy Wednesday, Holy Wednesday, climaxing with the commemoration of the mystical or Last Supper on Maundy Thursday, and the Passion of Jesus on Good Friday. Holy Week concludes with Christ's rest and death and descent into Hades on Holy Saturday. It is believed Jesus rested in death from the ninth hour, 3 p.m. on Good Friday until just before dawn on Sunday morning, the day of his resurrection from death, commonly known as Easter Sunday. Okay, so here again, we start with a Palm Sunday. And again, typically in very, very staunch, either Catholic or, or Orthodox countries. In, in, in Protestant countries, they typically don't celebrate Holy Week. They might celebrate... Good Friday and Easter Sunday in Protestant countries. Okay. But in Catholic countries and, and Orthodox countries, they, they take their Holy Weeks pretty seriously. Okay. So there is Palm Sundays. People will literally walk around town with palms and do all this other stuff. Highly, highly liturgical, highly, highly ceremonial, ritualistic. Okay. So are there similarities with the days that are here? with the days that are described in the pagan holiday. Mm -hmm. Okay, here is something that I want to show that is pretty interesting. Do you remember one of the things right here? Let's read this about the pagan holiday. Read this again, the blue part. So on March 24, Sanguim or Dies Sanguinis, Day of Blood, a frenzy of mourning when the devotees whip themselves to sprinkle the altars and effigy of Addis with their own blood. So during this ceremony, during this time of this Holy Week, a lot of these practicing people would walk around whipping themselves, okay? And they would be blood everywhere, ritualistically whipping themselves as the days of blood, okay? Let's read some of the things that happen here in Christianity. Okay, it's something called self-flagellation. Go ahead and read this part and highlight it. Self-flagellation is the disciplinary and devotional practice of flogging oneself with whips or other instruments that inflict pain. In Christianity, self-flagellation is practiced in the context of the doctrine of the mortification of the flesh and is seen as a spiritual discipline. It is often used as a form of penance and is intended to allow the flagellant to share in the sufferings of Jesus. Okay. Let's read that right there. Magdarami, penitence during Holy Week in the Philippines. Okay. What are these folks doing? They're whipping themselves. So is this a biblical practice or a non-biblical practice? Does not seem to be biblical. Okay. Here's the next one, which is Megaleisia, or I'm not even going to try to pronounce that because it's actually a, um, like, I think it's like a Saxon term. Okay. So this is like, like old, uh, Germanic tribe language. So I'm not even going to try to pronounce it. So let's read a couple of these things. So go ahead and read this in green. The Megalesia, Megalensia, or Megalensis Ludi was a festival celebrated in ancient Rome from April 4 to April 10 in honor of Cybele, known to Romans as Magna Mater, Great Mother. Okay, so the Megalesia follows Holy Week. So at the conclusion of Holy Week, you have this new festival. Okay, Holy Week concludes. And this new Sibeli or Cybele festival kicks in. All right. Let's read a little bit about Cybele. She's an Anatolian mother goddess. She became partially assimilated to aspects of the earth goddess Gaia and of the harvest mother goddess Demeter. She had a eunuch mendicant priesthood. In Rome, Cybele became known as Magna Mater, Great Mother. Okay. 
And now we're going to learn about the Germanic version of the same goddess. So Ostro is a West Germanic spring goddess. She is the namesake of the festival of Easter in some languages. The old English pagan Anglo-Saxons had held feasts in Ostro's honor, but that this tradition had died out by his time, replaced by the Christian Paschal month of celebration of the resurrection of Jesus. Okay. Iostre, that's her name, also known as Ostara. Okay. Iostre. Iostre. Iostre's ceremony and celebration she is also the same thing. She is all these things that were attributed to Sibeli are attributed to Iostre, the spring goddess, the earth goddess, the, 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 the fertility goddess. Does that make sense? But for the Anglo-Saxons. Okay. Read this last part again. Pagan Anglo-Saxons had held feasts in Eostra's honor, but that this tradition had died out by his time, replaced by the Christian Paschal month, a celebration of the resurrection of Jesus. Okay, so what happened to the Eostre tradition? It was replaced by G the celebration of Jesus. Was baptized. Keep reading. Well, well, we'll read more on this later. We'll read more on that later. Let's read this. Just the highlighted? Yep. So the hare was the sacred animal of Ostera. The hare was originally a bird and was changed into a quadruped by the goddess Ostera. In gratitude to Ostera or Eostre, the hare exercises its original bird function to lay eggs for the goddess on her festal day. Hares were frequently seen in gardens in spring and thus may have served as a convenient explanation for the origin of the colored eggs hidden there for children. Alternatively, there's a European tradition that hares laid eggs since a hare scratch or form and a lapwig's nest look very similar and both occur on grassland and are first seen in the spring. In the 19th century, the influence of Easter's cards, toys, and books was to make the Easter hare rabbit popular throughout Europe. German immigrants then exported the custom to Britain and America where it evolved into the Easter bunny. Okay, so was there any question before where the hair or Easter egg came from, or the, 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 the bunny or the egg came from? Mm -mm. No, they understood it as that hairs laid eggs and that Ostara or Iostre granted change them from birds to hares. Okay? I'm not saying that that's actually what happened, but I'm saying that's what they believed the goddess did. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Keep reading. A holiday named for the goddess is part of the neo-pagan Wiccan Wheel of the Year. Ostera 21 March. In some forms of Germanic neo-paganism, Eostra or Ostera is venerated. Among adherents, Eostra is associated with the coming of spring and the dawn, and her festival is celebrated at the spring equinox. Okay, so is Wicca still practiced this day? Yes. Is Wicca a pagan religion? Yes. Okay. They still venerate Eostra. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Okay. I just want to put that out there. Now let's look at the Christian. Let's read this. Easter, also called Pascha, Aramaic, Greek, Latin, or Resurrection Sunday, is a Christian festival and cultural holiday commemorating the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. The first council of Nicaea established only two rules, namely independence from the Hebrew calendar and worldwide uniformity. Okay. When was Easter established? 325. When is the trumpet blowing? I don't remember. 
but between the 4th century and the 6th century. So remember what I said, anything that is brought into the church between the 4th century and the 6th century, we must take with a high grain of salt. Does that make sense? So, did the apostles do this? No. No, they did not. When did this get brought into the church that everybody and their mother says, we are cool with this now? There, 325. Wormwood. Keep reading. And oh, by the way, right here. Look at this. Mm -hmm. So it needed independence from what specific calendar? The Hebrew. So when God set up his, his um, religious observations, what did he attach it to? The days of creation. And, and okay, so the days of creation. But specifically, when, when, when God gave any kind of holidays, right? So he had his holidays. There was Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Remember, we covered all of these in one of our previous uh, sessions, right? Or, 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 we did a whole series on this. There were all kinds of different things. Which calendar was it established? God was establishing what which calendar? The, the Hebrew, Hebrew calendar. calendar. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. The Hebrew calendar is designed after the biblical calendar. The calendar God gave the Hebrews. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. For example... When the Israelites left Egypt and, and the Passover happened, God said, this is day one for you. This starts a new year for you. This is happy new year. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. From here, we start your new calendar. And every other calendar event proceeds from this day. I'm not saying we have to follow the Hebrew ritual calendar necessarily. That's not what I'm prescribing here. But the Easter calendar, one of the things that they needed to do specifically was that it needed here. There's only two rules for this. We have to decouple it from the Hebrew calendar. So if you're purposely decoupling it from the Hebrew calendar, what are you decoupling it from? God's calendar. God's calendar. Does that make sense? We're decoupling God's resurrection from God's calendar. And oh, by the way, it needs to be adopted worldwide. Everybody's got to do it. So it can't be the one that God wanted it. It has to be the one that everybody else does. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. I just want to make that very, very abundantly clear. Let's read the last parts here. Easter customs vary across the Christian world in, and include sunrise services, midnight vigils, exclamations, and exchanges of Paschal greetings, clipping the church, decoration, and communal breaking of Easter eggs, a symbol of the empty tomb, the Easter bunny, and egg hunting. There are also traditional Easter foods that vary by region and culture. Okay, so... Some of the things that are included in this liturgy, the communal breaking of Easter eggs as a symbol of the empty tomb. Okay. The Easter bunny and egg hunting. Okay. And ritual foods. If you say so. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. All right. Keep reading. Um, in some traditions, the children put out their empty baskets for the Easter bunny to fill while they sleep. They wake to find their baskets filled with candy and eggs and other treats. Treats. A custom originating in Germany, the Easter bunny is a popular legendary anthropomorphic Easter giving gift giving character analogous to Santa Claus in American culture. 
Historically, foxes, cranes, and storks were also sometimes named as the mystical creatures. Since the rabbit is a pest in Australia, the Easter bilby is available as an alternative. Okay, so here we have a lot of problems with this. And this, again, is under the same Easter heading. Okay, this, this is Easter stuff. We're not, we're not talking about pagan stuff now. This is under the Easter umbrella. Okay, so we already read that it originated in Germany, but remember what the, how did the Germans see this? Did they see this as a, a Christian thing or did they see this as a celebration to Ostara or Yostre? Okay. It's a Wiccan practice. And it's a current Wiccan, well, it's a, Iostre is observed as a Wiccan goddess. She's venerated as a Wiccan goddess, currently. They don't believe in Easter bunnies. That's not what I'm saying Wiccas, Wiccans believe. But I'm saying that's what, back in the day, the original believers in Iostre did. Okay. But here is a popular, legendary anthropomorphic Easter, blah, 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 analogous to Santa Claus in the American culture. So, again, we all know that it's not a real thing. So if it's one of those things that's not a real thing, then why are we bringing it in and Christianizing it? Okay? Here it's talking about other acceptable replacements for the mystical creature. Storks, rabbits, okay? Even so much so that in Australia, rabbits are frowned upon, so you can use a bilby instead, which is a small kangaroo, okay? An Easter bilby. And then here we'll do the last part, which is the eggs. The egg is an ancient symbol of new life and rebirth. In Christianity, it became associated with Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection. For Christians, the Easter egg is a symbol of the empty tomb. Okay. Where in the Bible does it say this? Nowhere. But the church saw that the practice was being used for pagan means. So they what? They co-opted it. They co-opted They baptized it and said, well, that's the empty tomb. Ha ha, let's go find it. You get an extra bonus one if you find little baby Jesus inside one. Okay. Or if it's golden on the outside. Whatever it is. Here's the next one. Saturnalia. Let's read this. Um... Saturnalia is an ancient Roman festival and holiday in honor of the god Saturn held on 17 December of the Julian calendar and later expanded with festivities through to December 23 December. The holiday was celebrated with a sacrifice at the temple of Saturn in the Roman forum and a public banquet followed by private gift giving, continual partying and a carnival atmosphere. Saturnalia may have influenced some of the customs associated with later celebrations in Western Europe occurring in midwinter, particularly traditions associated with Christmas, the Feast of the Holy Innocents, and Epiphany. In particular, the historical Western European Christmas custom of electing a Lord of Misrule may have its roots in Saturnalia celebrations. Okay, so there's Saturnalia. Now let's talk about Christmas. The earliest source stating December 25 as the date of birth of Jesus was Hi Hippolytus of Rome, 170 to 236, written very early in the third century, based on the assumption that the conception of Jesus took place at the spring equinox, which he placed on March 25, to which he then added nine months. There is historical evidence that by the middle of the fourth century, the Christian churches of the East celebrated the birth and baptism of Jesus on the same day, on January 8th, while those in the West celebrated a nativity feast on December 25, perhaps influenced by, influenced by the winter solstice, and that by the last quarter of the fourth century, the calendars of both churches included both feasts. Okay, so there's a lot to digest here, okay? But... The reason why some people will say Jesus was born on December 25th is based on what? The assumption that his conception took place in the spring equinox. So first and foremost, it's based on an assumption. I don't care what the assumption is, but it's based on an assumption. Okay. Number one. Just want that to be... Very, very clear. 
It's based on an assumption. Okay. And it's not only based on an assumption, it's based on the assumption of the day of his conception. How easy is it to pinpoint the exact day of somebody's conception? Not very. Okay. Specifically, what did he base it on? The spring equinox. A celestial event. Why? Why? What part, where in the Bible does it base anything on Jesus' conception being a celestial event? There was a celestial event when? When he was born. When, when he was born. Came. When he was born, which would say, potentially, if you want to throw a celestial event, then maybe you can look for celestial events throughout global history, okay? And maybe you might be closer to pinpointing Jesus' actual birthday. Does that make sense? But there's nothing about a celestial event of his conception. So it was always based on an assumption and an assumption was it was it a consensus by a bunch of different people or was it assumption by a dude does that make sense okay that's number one number two did you know that for a long time this is when they celebrated jesus's birthday and did you know that in eastern orthodox countries they still will celebrate it on this day. So, for example, Ukrainian, Russian, Greek Orthodox, you name the Orthodox country, that's when they celebrate their Christmas. Okay? The West sticks to December 25th. But why? Based on what? The winter sol solstice. Another celestial event. Does that make sense? Okay. When did this start becoming a practice? The fourth century. When did Pergamum, the third seal, the third trumpet kick in? Third to sixth centuries. Fourth to six centuries. Okay. Keep reading. We're going to read a lot here now. Many names for months and days of the week, even the concept of a seven-day week, were borrowed from Roman paganism. From very early in the Christian era, the Feast of the Annunciation has been celebrated on March 25, commemorating both the belief that the spring equinox was not only the day of God's act of creation, but also the beginning of Christ's redemption of that same creation. In its first three centuries, Christianity did not celebrate the birth of Christ. Birthdays were pagan. No one actually knew when Jesus was born, and many of the early church fathers objected to the whole idea. Stop. Finally... Let's stop there. Let's stop there. Let's read this one more time. In its first three centuries, Christianity did not celebrate the birth of Christ. Okay. So when did they start again? Third century. Okay. Now let's read this one one more time. No and one actually Just read the knew. blue part. No one actually knew when Jesus was born, and many of the early church fathers objected to the whole idea. So the early, 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 so the closer you get to Jesus, does that make sense? The closer you actually get to Jesus, they're like, why does this matter? Why do we necessarily care when he was born here on earth if he's still alive there? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. He died and resurrected and he saved us from our sins. He's still alive there. Before Abraham was, I am, he said. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So his earthly birth was a great event because it led to him redeeming us. 
but he was alive before he was born. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So I am in very much agreement with this statement. Again, what we're trying to do here is I'm not trying to poo poo the idea of people that want to celebrate Christmas and all this other stuff. Okay? That's not what I'm here for. Right. But what I'm trying to show here is we need to know where it's coming from. Because a lot of us don't know where it's coming from. We just press a button because we grew up that way and we never knew. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. All right. Let's keep reading. Right here in the, right here on this red red thing. Once it finally was celebrated, it was on the 6th of January, not December 25. The earliest source dating December 25 as the date of birth of Jesus was Hi Hippolytus of Rome, 170 to 236, writing very early in the 3rd century, based on the assumption that the conception of Jesus took place at the spring equinox, which he placed on March 25, and then added nine months. By the year 354, December 25, as the birth date of Christ is found in a Roman calendar where it's not identified as a church feast, but is recorded as if December 25 had become the actual birth date as a historical fact. Theological themes and calculations may explain why the church eventually adopted a celebration of Jesus's birth, but not why December the 25th was chosen as a date. Historian Stephen Nissenbaum says this choice was a compromise. There is no All avoiding right. Roman Just, midwinter we'll, parties. We'll, we'll, we'll stop this real quick. This choice was a compromise. This choice was a compromise. This choice was a compromise. A baptism. It was a kumbaya. It was a you scratch my back, I scratch your back. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now let's keep reading what that compromise was. There is no avoiding Roman midwinter parties and Christianity's conscious decision to place a Christmas celebration right in the middle of them as part of that compromise. Okay. What is it? A conscious decision. It wasn't by mistake. The leaders of the church at the time said, hey, we need to take advantage of this. They're all happy. This Christianity thing is not necessarily seen positively. Let's change the optics and make it the fun, cool thing. All right. Keep reading. The Roman cult of soul had existed since the early Republic, and it was celebrated on December 20, on 25 December. In AD 274, the Roman emperor Aurelian made it an official cult alongside the other traditional Roman cults. Saturnalia was an ancient Roman festival in honor of the god Saturn, held on 17 December of the Julian calendar and later expanded to 23 December. The popularity of Saturnalia continued into the 3rd and 4th centuries, and as the Roman Empire came under Christian influence, many of its customs were recast into or at least influenced the seasonal celebration surrounding Christmas and the New Year. Many observers schooled in the classical tradition have noted similarities between the Saturnalia and historical revelry during the 12 days of Christmas and the Feast of Fools. Saturnalia has left its traces and found its parallels in great numbers of medieval and modern customs occurring about the same about the time of the winter solstice. Some way or another, Christmas was started to compete with rival Roman religions or to co-opt the winter celebrations as a way to spread Christianity or to baptize the winter festivals with Christian meaning in an effort to limit their drunken excesses. Most likely all three. Interesting the words that are used here, okay, by this historian. Co-opt. Baptize. Why? Because it was a competition. If you can't beat, what is a competition? Somebody's got to win in a competition. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. If you can't beat them, join them. Does that make sense? Yeah. Did this, was this prophesied by John? 200 years after his death, 
Did, did he prophesy that something would happen 200 years after his death? Yeah. That this specific thing would happen 200 years after his death? Mm -hmm. Okay. Does the Bible vindicate itself? Yep. With the truth of its word. Here's okay. something very interesting about Saul. Okay. This is the sun god, Saul. All right. Why December 25th? Specifically, so Saturnalia ends right here on the 23rd. That's the final day. So that was the official understanding as the final day of the solstice. Why? Because that is when the night is the longest. However, the 25th was when they finally understood that the days would start getting a little bit longer once again, which means that the sun is fighting back against the darkness. The darkness had been winning until now, but now the sun is fighting back against the darkness. That's why the 25th is the big deal for them. The sun is conquering now. The day is getting longer than the darkness. So that's why December 25th was the big day for them. Now let's finish reading here the last parts in, in green. With the spread of Christianity, some of the local Germanic solstice celebrations, midsummer festivals were incorporated into St. John's Day festivities, notably for the evening before. Martin Luther King Jr. wrote about this connection while in late 1949 or early 1950, noting that the place of Bethlehem selected by early Christians as Jesus's birthplace was an early shrine of a pagan god, Adonis. Okay, so even Jesus's birthplace in Jerusalem was a previous pagan shrine. Okay, I want to show that. Now the last one before we, we, we close out this holiday observances. Dies Solis, which is basically Sunday, okay? Dies means day in, in, in Latin, and solus means day, sun. So the days of the sun are the Sunday. Well, let's read this. And now we're going to learn again about Sol, the sun god. Emperors portrayed Sol and Victus on their official coinage with a wide range of legends, only a few of which incorporated the epithet Invictus, such as the legend Soli Invictu Comiti, claiming the unconquered sun as a companion to the emperor, used with fr particular frequency by Constantine, statuettes of Sol Invictus carried by the standard bear bearers appear in three places in relief on the Arch of Constantine. Constantine's official coinage continues to bear images of Sol until 325-326. A solidus of Con Constantine, as well as a gold medallion from his reign, depict the emperor's bust in profile twinned Jugate, Jugate with Sol Invictus, with the legend Invictus Constantinus. Constantine decreed Dies Solis, this day of the sun, Sunday, as the Roman day of rest. On the venerable day of the sun, let the magistrates and people residing in cities rest and let all workshops be closed. In the country, however, persons engaged in agriculture may freely and lawfully continue their pursuits because it often happens that another day is not suitable for grain growing or vine planting. Thus, by neglecting the proper mom moment for such operations, the bounty of heaven should be lost. Okay. So here's a couple of things to understand about Constantine. He was he was also known as the first Christian emperor because he was pagan first, then he became Christian. So that's one. This is him pre-Christian. Okay, so this is while he's still a pagan. And who was his deity of choice? The sun. The sun. He was a sun worshiper. All right. So much so that he made the Sunday the day of worship throughout his entire domain. Okay. He made a Sunday Sabbath. Interestingly enough, it was only for who? People in the cities. Only for the people in the cities. So city dwellers rest on the Sabbath. His Sabbath. Okay, not God's Sabbath. A human's Sabbath. Does that make sense? But if you're a country worker, keep doing what you're doing. You don't get a Sabbath. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So there's... There's a Sabbath by classes. 
Depending on what your function is in society, you get a Sabbath or you don't. Right? And it is a law. This is enforceable. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Magistrates will walk around the cities to ensure, hey, you need to be closed, you need to be closed, you need to be closed, you need to be, you need to be closed. Okay? No working on Sunday. All right. This is a pagan rule. Again, prior to Christianity. Okay. Just want to make right. that clear. Now there's something in Christianity called the Lord's Day, which happens to be on Sunday as well. Let's look at some of this stuff here. So there was a council called the Council of Laodicea. So go ahead and read this. The Council of Laodicea was a regional Christian synod of approximately 30 clerics from Asia Minor, which assembled about 363 to 364 in Laodicea. All right. So now... When did this happen? 363 to 364. How many folks were involved? 30 clerics. Okay. 30 guys in a very suspect time frame. Be very, 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 very careful where your doctrines and your teachings come from. Okay. Let's look at some of the things that were their concerns. During this time frame. So major concerns included maintaining order among bishops, clerics, and lay people. Canons 3 to 5, 11 to 13, 21 to 27, 40 to 44, and 56 to 57. Enforcing modest behavior of clerics and lay people. Regulating approach to heretics, Jews, and pagans. Outlawing the keeping of the Sabbath Saturday and encouraging rest on Sunday. Outlining liturgical practices restricting during Lent. Restrictions during Lent, admission and instruction of catechumens and neophytes, and specifying a biblical canon. So we're actually going to pull up these, specifically Canon 29, to see exactly what it does say, because we, we have a copy of it. But I will tell you that all of these canon laws are extremely problematic. Canon 29, probably the most problematic. Okay. I would argue it's probably um, wrong. I will 100% categorically tell you it's wrong. Okay. But let me just give you some, some caveats on these. Maintaining order among bishops, clerics, and lay people. By order, it means bishops are here. Clerics are here. Lay people are here. Does that make sense? We must maintain this order. We are here. You guys are somewhere down here. Enforcing. I'm not going to go any further than that. Because there should be no enforcement in the church. Regulating approach towards who? Heretics. That's a problem. Against who? Jews. That's a problem. And against who? Pagans. Okay. So even Jesus, when he sent his apostles to go minister around Judea, and he said, if you're confronted with somebody that disagrees with your preaching, do you remember what he told them to do? Dust your sandals. And do what? Move on. Move on. Should you do anything of harm or of neglect to them? No. Okay. We'll, again, we'll cover Canon 29 in a second. Outlining ceremonies and rituals. Again, we're not going to cover every little thing here, but there's a lot of problems with a whole list of, of their ceremonies and rituals. Restrictions during Lent. Here's a problem. Is Lent biblical? No. So why would there be any restrictions? Admissions and instructions to catechumens and neophytes. Do you know what catechumen mean? No. The cattle. Do you know what neophytes mean? 
No. The very, very unlearned. So what are they saying? They're comparing the unlearned to animals. No, they're, they're two categories. Okay. Neophytes are the people that just, just the baby Christians. That's what they consider neophytes. And catechumens are, they're not just lay people. So lay people would be people that actually want to help within a church community. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Catechumen are the people just showing up to church that do nothing. They are cattle. This is a nice way of saying it. It, it, it catechumen, the, 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 the way it is, is just basically the basic people. That, that's kind what it the means. the whole idea of the herd mentality? It's herd mentality, but the, the actual word catechumen means the cattle. Okay? But ideally, it just means the normal people. So, so again, you have here, the bishops are the highest of the high, the overseers of, of grand things. Clerics would be a local clergyman, right? So a local priest. Lay people would be that the ones that help the priest in their function at church. Does that make sense? Like a deacon. Okay. Catechumens are the people that show up, they put their money in the thing, and then they go home. They listen to the sermon and they're just happy to be there. A neophyte would be a new person that just joined. Hey, I'm interested in this Christianity thing. Okay. And then the last thing is specifying a biblical canon. They're not necessarily wrong in the biblical canon, but there are some problems with the biblical canon that they select, right? Let's just leave it at that. But we're here to talk about the Sunday because we can already see there's a problem here. Outlawing the keeping of the Sabbath. Okay. Let's actually look. At this. So this is something called New Advent, which is the Catholic Encyclopedia. It's, it's an actual Catholic um, resource. Resource. Okay. Right here. Right here. Catholic Encyclopedia. Um, very good resource. We will use it frequently. Right? They actually have the entirety. So you see here, Canon 5, Canon 7, whatever. They actually have it here. So that's why we can read what this thing is. So we're going to read what it actually says in Canon 29. So read Canon 29 and see what does it mean by outlaw the Sabbath and keep the Lord's Day. Christians must not Judaize by resting on the Sabbath, but must work on that day, rather honoring the Lord's day, and if they can, resting then as Christians. But if any shall be found to be Judaizers, let them be an anathema from Christ. All right. So do you see any problems with this? Yes. What are the problems? God wrote with his own finger Ten Commandments, one of which was to keep the Sabbath. It was God's commandment it wasn't okay. moses commandment it wasn't a commandment to the jews it was god's commandment actually he created it on in creation <laughs> when he said that he rested right so it was for all people that came from creation and so ultimately this is a direct affront to god's instruction okay so were there any jews at creation no so how could that be a judaizing thing that's a problem Secondly, it is highly anti-Semitic. <laughs> Twice is the word Judaizer in a bad way. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Also, it says that you must work on that day. So it's an anti-Sabbath commandment. It's not just outlawing it, saying, no, no, no. You can't even elect to rest on it if you wanted to. You have to work on it. Okay? It leaves no room for freedom of choice. It leaves no room for freedom of expression. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Here's the other problem with it. 
even if they wanted to substitute the Lord's Day with a, a Sabbath, okay? How do they do it? I'm not sure if I understand where you want to go. What does it say right there in blue that I just if highlighted? If they can. So they don't have to rest, but if they can, they should. Ah, it's optional. So it's not an option for you to actually keep the Sabbath. But it is an option if you want to keep the Lord's Day. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. you can, you're not allowed to rest on Sabbath. But if you want to rest on Sunday, you can. You don't have to rest, but you can. Not only that, but you are cursed from Christ if you rest on the day that Christ said, I am the Lord of. Okay. Now let's read, and this will be the last part. Let's read a couple of things again. We're back in New Advent, the Catholic Encyclopedia, and let's see what they say about Sunday. Okay, let's read what they say about Sunday. Sunday, day of the sun, as the name of the first of the first day of the week. Sunday was the first day of the week according to the Jewish method of reckoning. But for Christians, it began to take the place of the Jewish Sabbath in apostolic times as the day set apart for the public and solemn worship of God. It is called the Lord's Day. Okay, let's stop right there. Is this factual what they said here? Did the day take the place of the Jewish Sabbath in apostolic times? No. When did it take the place of the Jewish Sabbath? In the Council of Laodicea. After this date. That is when it became a rule. It was not in apostolic times. Okay? Let's keep reading. Practice and tradition had consecrated this Sunday to the public worship of God by the hearing of the Mass and the resting from work. With the opening of the fourth century, positive legislation, both ecclesiastical and civil, began to make these duties more definite. The Council of Elvira in 300 decreed, if anyone in the city neglects to come to church for three Sundays, let him be excommunicated for a short time so that he may be corrected. In the apostolic constitutions, which belong to the end of the fourth century, both the hearing of the mass and the rest from work are prescribed, and the precept is attributed to the apostles. The holy doctors of the church had decreed that the whole glory of the Jewish Sabbath had been transferred to the Sunday, and that Christians must keep the Sunday holy in the same way as the Jews had been commanded to keep holy the Sabbath day. All right, so let's let's revisit a whole bunch of stuff here. What are these words right here? Practice and tradition. That's what I want. Practice and tradition had consecrated the Sunday. Okay. Let's look at this verse real quick. On the seventh day, God completed his work, which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it he had rested from all his work, which he had created and made. Okay. God blessed it, and he made it holy. Okay. Right here in the Bible, it says, God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. Here we have practice and tradition consecrated means to make holy okay practice and tradition made holy the sunday 
Now let's read this. The holy doctors of the church had decreed that the whole glory of the Jewish Sabbath had been transferred to the Sunday. Okay. Who decreed? The holy doctors of the church. When did they do this? In the fourth century. How did they do this? With legislation, both ecclesiastical and civil. What were the two means? Ecclesiastical, which is religious, and civil, which is um, secular. Church and, and state. Could they do this through hearts and minds? How did they have to do this? They had to enforce it. Had to be enforced. So if something had to be enforced, was it the fact that everyone was doing it since apostolic times? Okay. Let's read this last part and then we'll be finished. A council of Laodicea held toward the end of the fourth century was content to prescribe that on the Lord's day, the faithful were to abstain from work as far as possible. Others showed an inclination to apply the law of the Jewish Sabbath to the observance of the Christian Sunday. From the 8th century, the law began to be formulated as it exists at the present day, and the local councils forbade sub servile work, public buying and selling, pleading in the law courts, and the public and solemn taking of oaths. There is a large body of civil legislation on the Sunday rests side by side with the ecclesiastical. It begins with an edict of Constantine, the first Christian emperor who forbade judges to sit in townspe townspeople to work on Sunday. He made an exception in favor of agriculture. The breaking of the law of Sunday rest was punished by the Anglo-Saxon legislation in England like other crimes and misdemeanors. After the Reformation under Puritan influence, many laws were passed in England whose effect is still visible in the stringency of the English Sabbath. Still more is this case is this the case in Scotland? There is no federal legislation in the United States on the observance of the Sunday, but nearly all the states of the Union have statutes tend tending to repress unnecessary labor and to restrain the liquor traffic. Okay. On the continent of Europe, in recent years, there have been several laws passed in direction of enforcing the observance of Sunday rest for the benefit of workmen. Okay. So, is the Lord's Day or a Sunday observance a Christian thing or a pagan thing? Originally pagan. Was it blessed and hallowed by God or by the doctors of the church? Doctors of the church. When was it introduced into Christianity? In the fourth century. Okay. Is it wormwood? Question yes. mark. Okay. So I know we went kind of long today. Oops. I know we went kind of long today. But I think it's important to, to go with the flow of what we're studying. Okay. I wanted to make sure we got all of the holidays and observances under one, one window. All right. So what did you take from today? Holidays and observances, Wormwood. Um, just understanding that the origin, just the origin of what we do. Yep. So once we understand where it comes from, we need to take a reflection of Jesus and the apostolic church. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. One of the things that I, I like to see and, and find very interesting when I watch TV shows or movies, whatever, and then they show, uh, you know, religion. Christianity specifically, whatever it is. And it, and it always like fascinates me to see like these amazing monolithic churches, whether it's a cathedral or a, a really, a, you know, these mega churches we have in the South in the United States or in the West Coast or whatever it is. And I think about the Jewish system. And, and I think it's like, that's what Jesus came from, right? When Jesus came, he tried to reform Judaism. 
Does that make sense? So if Jesus came to reform Judaism, and then we look at what Christianity is today, how far off are we from Judaism? Does that make sense? The clothes we we wear, I'm, and I'm talking about the, the, the people, I'm talking about the, the clerics. Does that make sense? The priests and the reverends and the, the, the ministers and the whoever's running things. Okay? The buildings themselves, the statues or the, 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 the cups they carry or the, the smoke that's around the place. How far off of that of Judaism? And Jesus came to reform Judaism because he saw that Judaism was problematic. And yet, we don't even know what Christianity comes from and what's infiltrated Christianity. And that, oh, by the way, an apostle in prison wrote about this and he saw this as God's vision that he gave him of something that would happen two to three hundred years later. And he gave him the key, he gave him the code and he gave us the scripture to break that code to show how the devil would infiltrate his church to try to, to, to make us lost from within. Does that make sense? And yet, because we don't study, we don't even know. We don't know how far off we are. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. So um, next week, what we're going to study is, uh, what is it? Um, philosophies and practices. Okay. And so again, I'm sorry we went, we did go late. It's probably a really long one, so I'm sorry. But I need to get the whole thing in there. So I'll go ahead and pray to close this out. Dear Emily Father, thank you uh, for giving us this time that we can go through and study these th- these things, Lord, to hopefully unmask and unravel some of the things that the devil has tried to to hide in the shadows, Lord, for so long and and to, you know, disguise as things that you would like or you would want us to do, Lord, but yet they are things that he's been doing to counterfeit you and your mission for such a long time. Lord, I pray that this message goes far and wide and that there are those out there that will see this and hopefully they will go back into your word and learn what you did, Lord, and reflect your character to others. In Jesus' holy name. Amen. Bye-bye.